Hi everyone, I'm back uh, in disguise again. I've changed it to the moustache. <clears throat> I'm hanging around here at Cyril Week because uh, a, a little birdie, and it's a big birdie actually, called Brian Sullivan right there. I'll show him to you. He told me that he's about to interview Senator Manchin. So I'm gonna hang out and, uh, there he is. I'm gonna hang out and see if I can press the flesh with the Senator who's you know, I mean, a very interesting figure. He was identified early, before the Biden administration, as the key um, kingmaker of the whole uh, Biden administration as regards energy. Uh, it was actually Frank Kelly, a uh, Washington, D.C. guy, who made that call, and he was absolutely spot on. And of course, Manchin did indeed uh, really be the kingmaker for the energy policy and the. Uh, there's fairly significant, the significant uh, legislation, IRA, that was signed. Additionally, I just listened to a speech by, a lunch speech by Jennifer Granholm, who was, uh, you know, quite the speaker, actually. It was uh, oratorical. She was making a lot of jokes. She handled the crowd very well. And the lobbyists were telling me that she's always been sort of the most charismatic speaker of the Biden administration, which I hadn't really appreciated. All I know her for is that time when they announced the SPR 60 million barrel uh, release and uh, then when she was asked how much oil does the US consume every day and she didn't know the answer. And whilst I was impressed by her style certainly and some pretty good content, she was kind of talking down the LNG export ban and stuff and saying that everything that's been approved is going ahead. It was pointed out to me that, uh, and I haven't been here, this is my first time at Sierra Week, I really had no idea what to expect. Uh, Sierra Week in Houston of course. Uh, it was said that, you know, three years ago when she showed up, she was an absolute disaster because she actually stood up and told the significant, the biggest industry gathering essentially of the year that oil and gas was over and that the administration was going to come and change everything and we weren't needed anymore. That would, of course, been the year before Russia invaded Ukraine and suddenly they were scrambling and downloading the SPR. Amos Hochstein is really the power behind the throne now in energy and he's here too. So long story short, I'm at Zero Week and I'll say maybe a couple more things about it. Just, uh, just a striking number of white men in suits. I'm uh, in disguise and not wearing a suit, but I can tell you, man, there is a lot of blue suits around here and there is overwhelmingly male. Uh, must be probably 10% woman, 90%, 30, 35 to 55-year-old men in blue suits. That's Zero Week. Okay, why is uh, my clients here? Kind of why am I here? Well, of course, it's Exxon Chevron. Uh, Hess and big speech this morning from Darren Woods in which he seemed to say, well he did directly say that Exxon's not trying to buy Hess. So that's kind of put paid to one of the working theories about why Exxon's doing what it's doing because the confusion here is we don't know why Exxon's doing what it's doing if it's not trying to get a slice of Guyana. And of course saying we don't want to buy Hess is ingenuous because Guyana is Hess, right? From a valuation point of view it's arguably semantics. If you say we just want a slice of Guyana but not Hess kind of, uh, again, it's kind of semantics because obviously the real attraction of, we've got about $140, I think it is, of our NAV of 170 for, for, for Hess is all Guyana. So you can say we don't want to buy all of Hess, but we want a slice of Guyana. You might as well say the same thing. Anyway, that's been kind of the headline of the day uh, in terms of why my clients are here, uh, that Exxon uh, said it, explicitly said it's not trying to buy the whole of Hess and it's just trying to exert its rights. But side conversations with certain companies that you can imagine who they are, remain extremely confident. And we agree, and I'm quoted in the FT saying this, that there's no precedent for a corporate takeover to trigger a, um, a preemption on an asset. I mean, imagine Exxon uh, for Pioneer, if that triggers preemption rights for every single block in the Permian, it's gonna be a, an unholy mess. And so. It remains a bit difficult to understand what Exxon are doing unless they're just trying to not have Chevron as a partner, which was the theory that was put to me by somebody who's well in the know. And he just thinks that Exxon's trying to put a spanner in the works, which again seems a slightly odd thing because Chevron and Exxon are partnered in so many places and Exxon will remain operated. So I kind of can't work that one out. Elsewhere, um, nobody really around these parts in these big industry, con these big executive conferences talks about the oil price. It's more or less received wisdom that they don't have a clue what's going to happen next to your price. 
That's kind of interesting because in reality, uh, these companies are totally driven by the oil price. And I was told years ago by a head of strategy of an oil uh, who had formerly been a sell side analyst, these companies should spend 90% of their time worrying about working out the oil price and 10% working out the strategy. Because if you get the oil price right, uh, the strategy is pretty straightforward. And of course, if you look at the major mistakes, strategic mistakes that have been made, apart from capex blowouts uh, over the years, almost invariably they pertain to getting the oil price cycle wrong. So we're thinking a lot about the oil price. I do think the Iraq, I'd like to do some work on Iraq because that's obviously significant and that's getting some headlines today saying that they're going to respect their OPEC quotas. Uh, the Russian infrastructure tax, again, I've said I think is very significant. And I think it's sig significant for Chevron because, of course, the more you attack Russian oil infrastructure, the more vulnerable Chevron looks at Tengi Chevroil, which, of course, is a huge project currently under development in Kazakhstan, which is almost entirely dependent on pipeline through Russia to the Black Sea. And so, you know, to me, these, these uh, attacks that you're seeing on, on Russian oil infrastructure become very risky or increase the risk for Chevron, which increases their desire to buy Hess. So we'll see. It looks like best guess at the moment is that the Hess um, situation just continues rolling on through arbitration and Chevron and Hess win. And that's just going to take months. That's sort of the conclusion of the merger of guys. And these guys are sharp. So that's that. And I'll leave it there. I hope you have a great week. I'll be here all week, actually.